Please welcome Helena Fern, Monash University. Hi, my name's Helena Fern and I'm the Director of Commercialisation Strategy at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Monash University is the largest university in Australia and is a leading global research university. We are very fortunate to be home of the number one pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences school in the world and have a thriving culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm very pleased to introduce you to our nomination company, Jupiter Ionics. Built on the world leading research from Professor Doug McFarlane and his talented team of researchers in electromaterials science, Jupiter Ionics have built a vision for a future powered by green ammonia. Their patented technology uses a novel electrochemical process to transform nitrogen from the air around us into liquid ammonia using nothing other than water and renewable energy. This breakthrough technology was spun out of Monash as Jupiter Ionics in early 2021 and has been going from strength to strength. Here to tell you more about their technology and a bold vision for the future is their CEO, Charlie Day, who has been leading the commercialization of the company since day one. Breaking the wall to carbon-free fertilizers. Charlie Day, Jupiter Ionics. Good morning. Today, I want to talk to you about a story of fertiliser. But it's actually more than just fertiliser. It's the story of humanity as a whole. You see, 150 years ago, people got their fertiliser from naturally occurring sources, like this pile of bird poo, or guano, as it's called. But as the 20th century dawned, the world realised that sources like this were running out, and the world's food supply was in under threat. Put simply, we had reached the limits of what Mother Nature could provide for us. But fortunately, two Germans came to the rescue, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, and developed the process that today bears their name. The Haber-Bosch process takes uh, hydrogen, from, typically derived from fossil fuels, and combines it with nitrogen from the air around us in a, in a high temperature and high pressure process to make ammonia, which is a key precursor for all nitrogen-based fertilisers. And thanks to these two Germans, through the 20th century, the world's population continued to grow and we were able to make enough fertiliser to feed that world. But today we face a new challenge. But you are once again hitting a limit of what Mother Nature can do for us. Because using fossil fuels to power the Harbour Bosch process generates two tonnes of carbon dioxide for every tonne of ammonia that we make. That means that fertiliser production is responsible for 2% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions today. So if the world's past in the 20th century relied upon us finding a synthetic pathway to make ammonia, our future may well depend on our ability to find a carbon neutral synthetic process to make green ammonia. Um, but there's a bonus here, because if we can make green ammonia, it doesn't just help us to solve the fertiliser problem. It can also help us to solve other decarbonisation challenges that we face, including the need to decarbonise international shipping. Ammonia makes a great fuel for such ships. And also the potential to move renewable energy around the globe in the form of, nitri uh, of ammonia. But it's no small challenge, because not only do we need to come up with the infrastructure to make green ammonia to the tune of 200 million tonnes today's demand, but if these things all pay out, we need to find a way to make three to four times as much by 2050. And that is where our company, Jupiter Ionics, enters the story. You see, our founders, Professor Doug McFarlane and Professor Alexander, Dr Alexander Simonov at Monash University in Australia, have cracked the code of a new pathway to make green ammonia. Like the Harbour Bosch process, it uses nitrogen from the air around us. But crucially, it uses electricity to drive the process rather than fossil energy. That means that we can drive it with renewably generated uh, electricity from wind and solar powered sources. Crucially, it also means that we can run this process um, at smaller scales and in a more distributed fashion, potentially making ammonia much closer to the point of use, for example, on the farm. And that's important because if you want to build a Harbour Bosch plant today, the typical upfront cost is about a, million, about a billion US dollars. Our technology opens up the chance to build much, much smaller plants where the price of entry is in the millions or potentially even less. So we can move to a much more decentralised world for the production of ammonia. 
Now, the scientific significance of our work has already been recognised. We've had publications in science and nature in the last couple of years. Um, but the commercial significance has also been recognised by partnerships with major Australian corporates, including West Farmers and Fortescue Future Industries. And working with those partners, our team of talented scientists and engineers are working to bring this technology to scale as quickly as possible. We started this journey uh, with uh, reactors that were barely larger than the head of a pin. But uh, we achieved results that were uh, in line with targets set by the US Department of Energy. Today, our latest prototypes can still be held in the palm of your hand, as you see our co-founder, Professor Doug McFarlane, doing here. But over the next few years, we'll be taking that technology and scaling it up to the size of a shipping container, making ammonia by the tonne uh, for applications on farm. Now, 2022, for the, the farmers that we work with, has been a tumultuous year. It's been a year in which fertiliser and, frankly, hope has been <coughs> in very short supply. But we believe that with Jupiter Ionics technology, we can empower farmers to actually take on the decarbonisation challenge themselves and make green ammonia and green fertiliser on farm. And we think that'll bring hope not just to those farmers, but to all the rest of humanity that depends on them for our food. Thank you. Wonderful. We're going to go straight to the questions, obviously. And uh, who wants to start? This time it's your time. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. Can you talk a little bit about the catalyst and the availability of that catalyst as you think about scaling? Yeah, so our process uh, is unlike some other approaches to, to making this. Um, it's a mediated rather than a catalyzed process, and we use lithium as, as the mediator. Obviously, there's demand for lithium uh, around the world, but the amount of lithium that we use is pretty small compared to the amount of, uh, of ammonia that we make, and it's regenerated through the process. So uh, the, the catalyst is not a major cost of our overall uh, production. Yeah, so the, the, um, there's a phosphonium salt that we use as a proton carrier within the, uh, within the reactor. Again, not used up during the process, so not a major cost to the overall uh, production cost. Next question by Sabine. Can we have the microphone, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very exciting. Do you have already customer in your pipeline? Um, so we're still relatively early in our technology journey. We're at, at, at TRL5. So we have two partnerships that I mentioned, yes. um, and we're working with a number of farmers who would like us to place pilot units onto their farms. Okay. Um, and so over the next two years, we, we plan to place uh, pilot units onto farms, but we don't have customers just yet. We're a little bit too early in our product development. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, and then Anna. Can you talk about the energy bill compared to the f use of fuel and your, in your system? What's the difference? Uh, yeah, so the, the, um, uh, the cost of energy is one of the key costs of the, of the inputs in our process. Um, our process currently is slightly more, uh, cost, more costly in energy terms um, than the Harbour Bosch process, but we are cheaper in capital cost terms. So we, we uh, make up a benefit on the capital cost uh, uh, in, uh, in contrast to our energy cost, but that's a key part of our research development program is to pull that energy cost down over time. Next question, Anna, please. Basically, um, same question, or similar question. Um, so it's amazing that you um, uh, like decentralize the production, uh, but um, due to economy of scale, I guess in, in total the the cost per ton of ammonia would be much higher. Or do you can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, so interestingly, uh, the, the cost of ammonia per tonne has tripled in the last two years, thanks just to, to market forces. And so um, when we talk about what's the competitive price of ammonia, it's a, it's a challenging question. But to, to answer your point, one of the advantages of moving to a decentralised model um, is that we're not competing with the wholesale price, but the, the retail price, the actually delivery price. So that includes the costs and the carbon emissions uh, in the entire supply chain from factory uh, through to farm. And so we believe that that's a price point that we can compete with quite, com quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. Next question is here from the startups. Here, second row. Yes, thank you. Very cool tech. Do you use any precious metals in the electrochemical cell? Um, so on the anode side of the cell, we are uh, experimenting with some different uh, electro, uh, uh, different catalysts, um, but so far nothing too uh, exotic. Do you use platinum? No. Okay. We would have time for a very last question. Yes, please here, first row, also from the startups. Uh, how much heat is generated from the process from things like ore potential losses and things like that, and how do you remove that? 
Yeah, so there is heat. The inefficiencies in the cell uh, do generate heat, um, but we, we uh, release them through simple cooling systems. 30 seconds. Last question. Anyone? Okay. Well then, sure? Good. Thank you very much. Good luck for the rest. Thank you.